in Exodus chapter 33. We're just going to pick up where uh, Isaac's been teaching through on Wednesday nights. If you need a Bible, raise your hand and and we'll bring one to you so you can follow along with us and just make sure I'm telling you the truth. Amen. Need to check me. Keep me in check. So Exodus 33. Nobody needs a Bible. Everybody's brought their Bible tonight. Jim, Pastor Jimmy. Praise God. All right, so last week we were in Exodus 32. <laughs> this week we're going to be in Exodus 33. So uh, if you weren't here last week, just a little recap as to what took place. You know, we've been, we just, we just been going on a trip with Moses here through the book of Exodus and, and what a trip it's been, amen. There's been some ups and some downs and we've seen God's, hand moved miraculously upon the Israelites and just uh, great wonders and signs that have taken place on their behalf and just been amazing and but last week we saw the incident of the the golden calf affair right uh, where the Israelites they, they had just received the the commandments of the Lord and and they were all gun ho and yeah, we're going to follow, and we're going to obey uh, the commands that you have given to us. And then shortly thereafter, you know, Moses goes up to the mount and he's gone for uh, about 40 days, 40 nights. And they start to wonder. They start to become impatient. They, be, they start to, well, where, where is Moses? You know, and... And it's like that saying that goes, you know, when the cat's away, the mice will play, right? Their leader is absent, you know, Moses, and and uh, they begin to uh, take matters into their own hands, and they they want a god that they can worship. So they take all their jewelry, and and with it, they they form this golden calf, and and. Uh, and that's where their, their sin begins in idolatry. You know, they begin to worship this, this golden calf that, that was formed by, by Aaron himself. So we see how easy it is to, to be led astray when, when there's a lack of leadership, you know. And I thank God for, for Calvary Chapel and the leadership that we have here at this church. It's just, you know... Uh, they have a servant's heart, you know, they lead by example. They don't tell you to go and do something that they haven't already done themselves. You know, they're willing to get their hands dirty and get in the trenches and, and uh, you know, just just lead, you know, simply lead. And and that's what I love about this church is that, you know, it's it, and it's all done through the Word of God and the Spirit, you know, who leads and guides us. And we just follow Him and in turn, uh, the sheep follow. So it's a beautiful thing how that works. But we see that because of this, uh, there's some repercussions to this sin of idolatry, them, them having an affair with this false God that, that wasn't the, the true and living God that they were only to give their worship to, you know. And we, we do. We serve a jealous God who desires all of our heart, all of our soul, and all of our mind. And, you know, in today's today's age and, and world, you probably won't see that happening, you know, somebody bowing down to a golden calf. But but there are idols that, that, uh, that we tend to give our hearts to, you know, that take the, the priority of, of the big G God and the little G God kind of gets in the way and, and takes our passion from the big G God, you know, and it could be, it could come in any way, shape, or form, you know, it could be glitter, glittery, it could be, um, it could just, it could be subtle, it could be big and, and with a lot of power, and, you know, so, and I think we all know what, what those things might be in our lives that tend to draw us away from, from uh, the Almighty One, and that just, you know, it takes our worship from God and it puts it on, on the those other little G gods. So, so that's kind of what took place in uh, chapter 32 last week. So, 
let's see what takes place here in Exodus 33 this week and what God has in store for the Israelites. Amen. So if you would, please uh, follow along with me in Exodus 33 verses 1 through 6. Then the Lord said to Moses, Depart and go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt, to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, To your descendants I will give it, and I will send my angel before you. And I will drive out the Canaanite, and the Amorite, and the Hittite, and the Parasite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite, and the flashlight, and the termite. No. <laughs> go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in your midst, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. And when the people heard this bad news, they mourned, and no one put on Put on his ornaments, for the Lord had said to Moses, Say to the children of Israel, You are a stiff necked people. I could come up into your midst in one moment and consume you. Now therefore, take off your ornaments, that I may know what to do to you. So the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by Mount Horeb. Wow. So here we, we see that it's time to leave the Sinai Desert. And it's time to head to Canaan, the Promised Land. And I wonder the exact reason for this departure. You know, the, the scripture doesn't, isn't clear as to why God all of a sudden says, okay, pack your bags. We're moving, we're heading on, we're going on this trip to the promised land. And I'm sure he had his reasons, but he simply says to, to the Israelites, depart and go. Let's keep on moving, we're not, we're not to our destination, we're not where, where we need to be yet, we're not where I want you to be. So we gotta keep on moving. And, you know, I wonder sometimes if, if I'm ready to move when, when God says to move and stop and wait when he says stop and wait, you know. And, you know, it's like red light, green light, you know, stop, go. And, and that's my heart's desire, and, and I know that that's, that's not always the case in my life. You know, when he says to go or, or turn here or, or just wait, uh, sometimes I take matters into my own hands and, and I just do it my way. And we all know where our way gets us, right? <laughs> For me, it was uh, nine years in prison, my way. You know, I wanted it my way and I was going to do it my way and and there was, there was no, no stopping that. But I like God's way today. You know, it's free. <laughs> There's liberty in it. <laughs> so, you know, he's a good God. And, and there's a reason why he says, stop, go. You know, and it's all about his timing. It's perfect. It's good. It's for our safety. It's for our well-being. And, and it was time for the Israelites to move on. You know, and, and I think of our God as, as a good shepherd who's just, he's leading the way before us. And he knows where those green pastures are. He knows where that fresh living water is. You know, he knows where those trees are for, for, sh for shade on hot, sunny days. He knows the perfect place of protection from our enemy. 
you know, but we simply have to to say, yes, God, you know, it's time to move on. It's time to move on to a new chapter in my life. Whatever that is, I'm willing to, to face it and uh, to allow you to take and lead me by the hand and uh, just to trust in you simply and wholly, you know. And they knew that they were going into a land that was inhabited by their enemies. You know, it was occupied by the Amorites, the parasites, the termites, the, all of these ites, right? They were living there in the land that God had promised them. So how do you think that, ma that made them feel? Well, you know, how, how are we going to deal with these these people, these, you know, but God has a plan and he simply says, just follow me. You know, I love how in the gospels when he, he first encountered the disciples, he, he simply said, just drop your nets and follow me. You know, leave everything, your career and everything that you've worked for in life, leave it behind and just follow me in simple faith. It's not easy, right? Just to drop everything and say, okay, God, you're, I'm yours and, and you're mine. And, you know, like the song we sang earlier, you know, he's, he's, bought, he's bought us with his precious blood. Who are we to say, oh, no, God, I can't, I can't get on board with you. But he gave his life for you and I so that we can have life in return, you know. So, he says, depart and go. And another thing we see here in this passage is that despite their unfaithfulness to him, he remains faithful to them. You know, they had turned around and, and just cheated on God, right? They were unfaithful to him. They bowed down to this false god. They gave their allegiance to it. They worshipped it. But God nonetheless says, I'm still going to give you what I've declared to, your, to, to, the, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm still going to allow you to go into the promised land. Because I gave, I gave them my word. And I'm not going to go back on my word. You know, he's not a guy, a God that denies, you know. He keeps his word. He keeps his promises to us. You can't find that in the world today, right? Someone gives you the word. It's very rare that they keep their word, you know. But we can always count on God's word to be true. His promise to remain. He won't go back on it. Despite how we act and how we behave, you know, and and we saw, we saw this a little bit last week in the study how God God and Moses were kind of having a dispute, right? And and Moses would say, "Well, these are your people," and God would say, "No, these are your people. You brought them out of Egypt, and they're go, going back and forth, right? And they didn't want to own up to 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 them, but." God remains faithful despite our unfaithfulness. And this is something that we can rely on and trust in. This world and everything in it is fleeting. If you haven't noticed, right? It's falling apart. You know, it's crumbling. But his word shall endure forever. And when everything is said and gone, his word will still be there. We can count on it. If he's declared something to you, stand on it. It's his word. It will, it will come to fruition. In 2 Timothy 2.13, his word says, If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Amen? That's awesome that we can take hope in that, that God doesn't change. You know, his word says that he's immutable. 
He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't flip-flop around and one day he's, he's not a bipolar God. <laughs> you know, he's not one way today and then, and then tomorrow he's, he's, he's a whole different person. He's the same. He never changes. He's constant. And that's, that's something that we need in our lives is a constant. Because this world is doing this number, right? Up and down and up and down, you know? But God is constant. He's the same. And that's something that we, could, we can stand on. It's a beautiful thing. Not only does He keep His promise to them, but He also prepares the way before them. He says that He's going to send His angel before them. And He, he also goes on to say, I will drive out your enemies from the land. So... Wherever you go in life, know that God has already been there. He has gone before you to prepare the way. You know? You know, keep in mind, you know, if God calls you to something, He will prepare the way before you. And we got a saying here in Calvary Chapel, where God guides, He provides. Mm -hmm. Amen? So if He's called you to do something, He's prepared the way before you. You know, if He's calling you to go to Iraq and be a missionary, He's gone before you. As scary as that might sound or, or look like, or, you know, if He's calling you to it, He's preparing the way for you to go. Right? And, and that's neat. That's awesome. You know, that we could take hope in that. That He goes before us and, and prepares the way. In Proverbs 69, it says that a, man heart, a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. And that's where I want to be. I want to be directed by the Lord. I want Him to direct my path. I don't want to take the scenic route. I don't want to take a detour, right? I want to stay on the path that He's called me to. You know, I don't want to get off on a tangent and, and live for myself. I want to live for Him and, and whatever, whatever He has for me in my life. You know, and whatever He's called you and I to, we can do it because He's prepared the way. It's an open road. Amen? He's a great scout for you hunters. So, but God, but we also see here that God, God's not going to be going with them though. In this case, he says, I will not go up in your midst lest I consume you on the way for you are a stiff necked people. And you know, and, and when you first read this, you might think, man, that's harsh. You know, God's not going to go with them. Well, why is that? And it's simple. You know, God can't fellowship with sin. And the Israelites had just committed idolatry, adultery, if you may. And God in His, His consuming fire could not be in the midst of that. So He was being gracious and merciful toward them. And saying that, hey, I'm not going to go with you on this trip. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to be at a distance. And you know, sin does that. It, it disfellowships us from God. You know, when we're caught up in our sin and in our darkness and in ourselves, uh, we get out of fellowship with God. Not because God, you know, doesn't want a fellowship with us, but He can't. He can't hang out with us when we're all up in ourselves. You know, when we're when we're living for ourselves and we're we're caught up in our sin, he just he can't be there with us. You know, he can't abide with that. He can't dwell with that. He can't have fellowship with that. So that's the reason why God says, "I won't be in your midst." We got to deal with this sin of idolatry. 
we got to deal with that first. And as we read on, we're going to see that that's going to take place eventually. But sin keeps us from that fellowship with God. You know, it does. So that's what was going on there. In Hebrews 12, 29, he says that the writer of Hebrews says, Our God is a consuming fire. He's a consuming fire. And as a holy God, he must eliminate sin from his presence. But in this case, he extends grace to this stiff-necked people. And how, and how I thank God for his wonderful grace towards me as I too am stubborn and, and rebellious at times. You know, and that word stiff neck just simply means, you know, you don't want to go where, where God wants you to go. You know, it's like walking a pit bull, you know, that doesn't want to, you know, walk with you. It wants to take off. And, and that's what stiff-necked is. It just wants to go where it, it or he or she wants to go. It doesn't want to follow where the leader is guiding. You see? So stiff-necked people, just a, a rebellious, stubborn, stubborn people. And again, I thank God for his grace. And so many times that he extends that towards towards us when when we're acting that way you know where would I be without his amazing grace you know I'd be Kentucky Fried Chicken right <laughs> his consuming fire in my case it'd be Pollo Loco <laughs> but yeah I'd be toast you know I'd be done well done but God's good. He's graceful. He's gracious. He's merciful toward us time and time again. Even when we do this to him, you know, just stiff arm him like football. You know, I don't want anything to do with you right now, God. I want to do this my way. And he just simply says, okay, let me know how that works out for you. You know, I'll back off and let you have your way. You know, another trip through the wilderness, right? So, stubbornness, rebellion. I want to be dependent on God. I want Him to lead and guide my life. And, and, and I want His grace extended to me over and over. So, uh, but keep in mind that this shouldn't give us a license to sin. You know, His grace shouldn't, shouldn't give us a license to, to continue in sin. It should cause us to, to check our hearts, check our lives, and, and make changes, you know? Make some examinations, see, see where we need to improve in our lives, you know? Where we need our walk to, to get better, to be, to be strengthened. So... So when the people heard this bad news that, that God wasn't going with them, it says that they mourned. And, and throughout the Bible, this word mourn can, can point to repentance. Just having a repentant heart, you know. Uh, and they, and they, they, were th you know, they had just been promised the promised land. But at this point, the promised land didn't matter to them. What mattered to them was that God wasn't going with them. They were going to be missing out on His presence. That God was absent from their lives. You know, the promised land was, wasn't even in, in the picture at this point. They wanted God back in their lives. And it says that they began to mourn. Nothing, nothing else seemed to matter at this point. And they wanted God more than anything else. So the, what do they do? The children stripped themselves of their ornaments by Mount Horeb. And most scholars believe that 
they brought these ornaments with them when they came out of Egypt. And a lot of these ornaments had like pagan pagan idol like the moon and the stars and half crescent moons and whatnot. So they were basically, you know, idolatrous in a sense. So they 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 brought these things with them out of Egypt. But it says that they they stripped themselves of their ornaments. And with repentance, there comes a stripping away of sin. You know, uh, the Bible alludes to pluck it out, cut it off. Uh, in the epistles, it says put it off. Right? So they took the very thing that created the false God in their life and removed it. They stripped it away. They cut it loose. And they left it there at Mount Horeb where this horrible crime against God took place. And that's what we need to do at times. You know? We need to repent. We need to make a 360 and say, enough of this. I'm done cheating on God. I'm done giving my allegiance to you fill in the blank. For me, it was drugs and alcohol and, and just, uh, just that life of sin, you know? And I had to come to a point in life where I said, enough, I'm done. I can't continue to live like this. Not only am, am I grieving God when I act this way, but I'm hurting others. You know, I'm hurting myself. So, so we got to strip, strip those things from our lives. Whatever it is, it is causing us to, to dis disassociate with God, to disfellowship with Him. We've got to realize what they are in our lives, take notice of them, and get rid of them. Take them off. You know, do whatever it takes, whatever is necessary to get rid of that sin in your life. Whatever it is you got, whether you got to unplug the computer and get rid of it or, or put some accountability software on your, your computer or get rid of some old movies or, you know, if you're dating, have someone chaperone, whatever. Whatever it is that you need to do to get rid of that, do it. You know, because nothing else should matter than, than you having God in your life and, and experiencing His presence. You know, because sin separates us from that. So we can choose, right? The pleasures of this world for a time or, or experiencing God's goodness and His presence on a daily basis. You know, I choose the latter. I want to hang out with Jesus every chance I get. But if I'm living for other things, what's going to take my priority? What's going to take his place? What's these other things? So they strip down and they leave those things right there at, in Mount Horeb and they don't look back. They leave them there and they move on. They make up their mind that this is it. I'm done with this. In James 1.21 it says, Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. So lay aside, get rid of, put off. In Hebrews 12, 1, it, it kind of uh, echoes this. It says, therefore, we also... Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Amen? So sin weighs us down. You know? We're in this, this race called life, right? Right? And God wants us to get to the finish line. We got to get rid of those weights that ensnare us.
So let's continue on in verses 7 through 11. Continue reading here. Moses took his tent and pitched it outside the camp, far from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of meeting. And it came to pass that everyone who sought the Lord went out to the tabernacle of meeting, which was outside the camp. So it was, whenever Moses went out to the tabernacle, that all the people rose and each man stood at his tent door and watched Moses until he had gone into the tabernacle. And it came to pass when Moses entered the tabernacle that the pillar of cloud descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle. And the Lord talked with Moses. All the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the tabernacle door. And all the people rose and worshipped each man in his tent door. So the Lord spoke to Moses face to face, as a man speaks to his friend. And he would return to the camp. But his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. Amen. So here Moses says that he took his tent and pitched it outside the camp, far from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of meeting. Moses, at this point, decides that it's time to seek the Lord. And keep in mind that during this time, the tabernacle had not yet been constructed. Uh, Moses was given the plans and how to construct it, but it had not yet been constructed at, at this point. Notice Moses doesn't keep, doesn't allow that to, to keep him from, from worshiping God, right? That doesn't stop him. He says, I'm just going to take my tent and I'm going to make it a tabernacle of meeting. And I'm going to have my meeting time with, with Almighty God. And that's what he does. It says that he takes his tent and he pitches it outside of the camp, far from the camp. And last week we saw how he drew a line in the sand, right? And he said, those, those of you who are with me, you know, come and stand by me. And in a sense, he's doing the same thing here by taking this tent and pitching it outside of the camp. He's saying, okay, who wants to come and worship with me? There's a tent, it's set up, it's for worship. It's a mobile worship center, if you may, you know. It's a place to meet with God. And that's what tabernacle is, it's just, God, God meeting with the people and the people meeting with God. Tabernacle simply means to dwell amongst us. To dwell amongst us. So he engages God here. He meets with God. He seeks his presence. You know, and that's a beautiful place to be when we just simply say I need you God I can't do this on my own anymore I can't seem to figure this out I don't know why you know things are happening the way they are and and why people behave the way they do and 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 why I lost this job and why my marriage is in shambles and why this and why that I need you God and I think that's where Moses was at this, this point. He just said, I need, I need to meet with God. You know? And that's a beautiful place when we just come, come to grips with ourselves and say, I need to meet with God. And how so often we neglect that. You know, we take that for granted. And we just go about our busy day. And, and I like how, how Moses set that tent outside the camp. He separated himself from the noise and the busyness of, you know, just think millions and millions of Israelites, you know, within a camp. I just know what it's like to go camping with four grandkids, and it's noisy, 
You know? Just think of millions and millions of people. The motion and the commotion and the just bustling and this and that. And he wants to get away from all that. He wants to get alone with God where it's quiet, it's solitary. And he can commune with God and hear his voice. You know? And sometimes, you know, I don't know where your tent's at. I know where my tent's at. You know? I got my tent set up. And it's where it's a quiet place where just me and him can talk, you know? And notice what happens when he begins to worship God. It says that the other the other the others begin to follow suit, right? They take notice when Moses goes to this meeting place and he begins to worship God it says that they stand up at the doors of their tents and they begin to worship with him and that's that's a leader for you right and it just goes to show you that people are watching you they're wa they're paying attention to your life and how you live it and we're called to be examples to those around us you know, whether it's our children, our grandchildren, our brothers, sisters, our wives, our husbands, co-workers, people within our church body, the community. We're to be examples how we live our lives because others are watching, you know. And a leader doesn't have to ask someone to, to follow suit. It just happens somehow. People begin to get in line and begin to take notice and begin to, hey man, this guy's, the Lord really has his hand upon him. Maybe we should take notice of, of his life and what he's doing, you know, so that we could reap the benefits of that. But I don't, I don't want to just be a, a, a person that worships God from afar. You know, these guys worship God from the doors of their tents. They had access to this, this meeting place that Moses had. You know, I want to be close to God. I don't want to worship Him from a distance. Right? I want to press in. I want to get as close to Him as I possibly can. I want to go to this meeting place, this tent, this tabernacle of meeting. I want to meet with God as Moses did, face to face. Right? It says that he, he spoke to him like a friend. You know, he had, a, he had a dialogue with him. It just wasn't Moses doing all the talking or God doing all the talking. It, it was a mutual thing taking place there. You know, God spoke, Moses listened, and Moses would speak, God would listen. And that's what relationships are all about, right? You got to talk to people. You got to get to know them. You know, what their likes are, what their dislikes are, what, what kind of foods they like, uh, you know, what they like to wear, their favorite color. You get to know them. And that's what we're doing when we're communing with God. We're getting to know God. We're going to know him and his attributes, his character, what he likes, what he dislikes, you know. And that all takes place when we interact with him through prayer, through conversation, you know. And it's not one of these, hey, chum, chummy chum friend, like, hey, hey, what's up, you know. It's, it's a reverence. There's a reverence there. There's a respect. This is holy God. But he loves me as a friend, you know, and we can talk. We can talk about anything. And that's the relationship that Moses had here, not from a distance, but up close and personal. And that's what God desires of you and I. It's a personal relationship. You and him, nobody else. He's concerned about you and I, and he wants to hang out with you. He wants to abide with you. 
He wants to dwell with you. He wants to tabernacle with you. Amen? But He can't do that if we're involved in, in darkness and sin. You know? He, does, he says, yuck. Staying away from that. So, James 4.8 says, Draw near to God and He will draw near to you. Amen? Amen. Press in. And God will reveal Himself to you in a powerful way. Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We can approach Him boldly, it says, confidently. Right? His throne room is is accessible to you and I as, as his sons and daughters. And we can come confidently to his, his throne of grace that we might obtain mercy and grace in time of need. Let's read this last section in uh, for verses 12 through 23. One, one other thing I wanted to point out real quick, I forgot, is that notice how Joshua hangs out at the tabernacle, right? And we know, we know uh, through Scripture that Joshua is going to become the, the new leader, right? As Moses passes on, Joshua Joshua's the, the new leader on the scene. But notice it says there in, uh, in verse 11, that Moses would leave to go back to camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. He says, I'm going to hang out here as long as I can. I'm going get, to get as much as I can. I'm hanging out right here. you know. And that's what I love about Calvary Chapel. The doors are open just about every night of the week. There's something going on here, you know. And, and it's beautiful how we can fellowship as often as we like. It's our call. It's our choice, right? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you know, there's something going on. So, and, and also one other thing is that Moses was pouring into this young man's life, you know. And if, if we don't have someone that we're pouring into, we should, we should ask ourselves why not. You know, we should always be looking for others to pour into, to mentor, to come alongside of and, and help. Say, hey, uh, this is why we do this, and this is why we don't do that, and, and, and this is what God calls us to, you know. So just something to think about. So uh, verses 12 through 23, Then Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, Bring up this people. But you have not let me know you have not let me but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way that I may know you, and that I may find grace in your sight. And consider that this nation is your people. And he said, my presence will, be, will go with you, and I will give you rest. Then he said to him, If your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. For how then will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight, except you go with us? So we shall be separate, your people and I, from all the people who are upon the face of the earth. So the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you have spoken, for you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. And he said, Please, show me your glory. Then he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, You cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. And the Lord said, 
Here is a place by me, and you shall stand on the rock. So it shall be, while my glory passes by, that I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and will cover you with my hand while I pass by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Wow. Amazing, huh? So we see this dialogue between Moses and God. And, you know, it starts off with, hey, you know, I need to know who's going with me into the promised land, God. I know you said you're going to send this angel before me, but I need to know. I need some confirmation here. I need, I need to know. And he says, I, I'm not going alone. I'm not, I'm not going without you. He presses into the Lord and, and the Lord replies, I will be with you and my peace will settle, settle your heart. That word rest here means to settle. Just to give him a, a peace, a peace in his heart that surpasses all understanding. And, and that's what God's presence does in our lives, right? Gives us a peace. That he's in control. That all's going to be perfect according to his will. He's going to do what's best in, in every situation in life. You know, nothing goes across his desk without his stamp of approval or disapproval. So there's a peace that comes with his presence. You know, our hearts are settled when we're anxious and we're, we're, uh, we're stressed, you know. And we're looking to go into this, this new place and we know that it's inhabited by enemies and we want to know that, that God is with us, right? And that's what Moses is seeking here. So God says, I will, I, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And then Moses goes on to say, I just need affirmation here, God, one more time. If, if your presence does, does not go with us, do not bring us up from, from here. In other words, if, if you're not going to go with us, God, then we're just going we're just gonna to stay put right here. We're not, we're not going anywhere without you. You know, and it just shows Moses' heart to us. He, he didn't want to move without God's direction, without God's presence in his life and upon the nation of Israel. He says, we're better off just staying put. If you're not going with us, then we're not moving. And that's, and that's a beautiful thing that I want, to, I want to go wherever God goes. And since he's on a roll, he decides, I'm going to ask one more thing of God. You know, he's, he's two for two. And he goes for, for, he says, hey, I want to see your glory, God. Show me your glory. I want more of you, God. I want, I want to go deeper with you. And we see that. We see Moses is just his dissatisfaction with with not remaining where, where where he was. He wanted to to go deeper with God. He wanted to grow deeper. He wanted to to see new things. He wanted to experience God in a in a deeper way. So God again says, "Yeah, I will let you see my glory." But you can't see my face, you know, and, and I think this is where we get the word afterglow from, you know, he just sees the, the after effects as God covers him in the cleft of the rock and protects him from his glory. And he just sees a glimpse of God's glory, you know, and, and I believe that's what, where God wants to take you and I is just to that place where we just want to rest in his glory we want to be bathed in his presence and we want to go deeper with him so 
as the, the music ministers come and just share one closing song with us, I just, I just pray and ask that, you know, the word tonight would just challenge us in that fashion. That we would want to seek more and more of God in our lives. You know, maybe you're okay with where, where you're at. Uh, maybe you want, you want to grow deeper with Him. Uh, God is saying, I'm accessible. You know, I'll meet with you. You just got to press in. You got to, you got to make the effort and meet me. Come and commune with me and I will show you great and mighty things. So, as we close with this last song, just allow the Spirit to, to move upon you and, and we'll close in prayer afterwards. Amen. thank you for your blood Lord we thank you that you are here amongst us now thank you Lord that you will never leave us nor forsake us God we want to see your face we want you to be glorified in our lives Lord we want that cloud to, to be above us that others would see your glory in our lives, God. And that we would just simply point to you, Jesus, in the way we worship you throughout the day, God. 
Lord, we thank you that we can meet with you. We thank you that you are a living God who hears us and talks with us and allows us to get glimpses of you, allows us to touch you and experience your goodness in our lives, God. We thank you for your great love toward us, God. Lord, we ask that you would strip away anything that might, might be keeping us from giving you our very lives, Lord. Maybe there's other loves or passions that we've put before you, God. We want to repent of those now and ask that you would remove them, strip us from them, God. We want to be whole before you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for your people, and I just pray your blessing upon them, Lord. We thank you that we can tabernacle with you on a daily basis. May we take advantage of that, Lord, as the days get darker. So bless your people, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. 